is Jackson Smith, and I am a summer intern here at the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia. Today, we would usually be commemorating the number two construction battalion, Canada's first and only all-black regiment to serve in the First World War. Unfortunately, we, can, we are not able to celebrate and pick on Nova Scotia due to COVID restrictions. So on behalf of our President Craig Smith, our Executive Director Russell Gross, we would like to welcome you to join us for a short video of clips from previous years. The number two construction battalion fought for the right to serve, and today we remember the contributions made on the shores of Picto 104 years ago. Governor of Nova Scotia, eyes left. Look. Eyes left. Eyes left. I think it's fair to say that when my father began his work on the number two construction battalion, he wanted to make it known to the Canadian public that there were this group of men who had, were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, even though their very own country had effectively turned its back on them, for the sole reason that their skin was a different color. It had nothing to do with their competencies, their bravery, or their dedication, strictly because of the color of their skin. But in writing that book, it was not to be served as a condemnation. It was to serve as a commemoration. Yeah. And that's why we're here today. The number two construction battalion and the work they accomplish is part of our overall legacy. It's important to all of us. Picto has become important to all of us. You know, as a child growing up, my father would speak often about the number two construction battalion. And I must confess that I paid very little attention to him at that time. Those of you who know my father, he would speak about a lot of things. And he spoke quite often about the number two construction with great conviction and dedication. I was too young to realize that others were not talking about the number two construction battalion. I figured that was a conversation in most households. I was shocked and sad when I realized that it wasn't. He wanted to bring that story back to life. He wanted to, in fact, resurrect the number two construction battalion. Yeah. He wanted the public to know what they had done and why it was important. And he accomplished that. But I must tell you, I don't think that my father could fully envision what his book, what that work would have accomplished. With that book, he gave pride to those men, who at that time, those few survivors who were still living, he gave, gave pride to them before where they had been ignored. He gave pride to their family members. In fact, I can say that he gave pride to his own family. Not just because of what he had accomplished, but as well, the reason for doing so. It had nothing to do with self-aggrandizement. That was not his objective. His objective was to make sure that myself as his son, his granddaughters, and all of us knew the story so we could pass it on. So we could pass it on. But you know, at the end of the day, not one, a man standing alone or a woman standing alone cannot continue to make something happen, not all alone. And I realize that in this case, the fact that we're here today, the fact that there's the memorial site, memorial site goes to all of us. And I need to thank the Black Culture Society for what they have done in keeping this going. I need to thank uh, your honors. I, you know, I know how busy you certainly can be and must be and yet your appearance at this event is so very important. And I appreciate <laughs> it. 
And I must say that it never strikes me as being a pro forma appearance. This is something that means much to you, and it means much to us, and it means much to the Ruck family. I thank you so very much for doing that. There's also one other person who must be thanked. I think it's fair to say, and I do not profess to speak on behalf of the African Nova Scotia population, but there have been times in our history when there are certain areas, certain towns and communities, which do not sometimes come across as being particularly welcoming. There have been times when we have felt fearful about going to certain places, certain stores, certain businesses. As a child, Picto to me was primarily a sign on the side of the highway. I didn't come here often. I didn't know very much about Picto. The event that took place in 1993, when the first commemoration ceremony took place, was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. It was a hot day. The place was crowded. People came from across Canada. People came from across North America to be here on that day. And it was significant. But one of the most significant moments of that day that still strikes me, that I still feel very deeply about, is when the former mayor of the town of Picto came to the podium and during the course of his speech, as he was winding up, he put out there an invitation that the Black Cultural Society make this an annual occurrence. Mm -hmm. Most extraordinary, most extraordinary. We have recently seen the Confederate flag lowered over the State Capitol building in South Carolina. And on that day in 1993, the former mayor, Loris LeBlanc, raised the flag on behalf of Picto, saying, your heritage is part of our heritage. Yes. And our heritage is part of your heritage. We're reminded of the sacrifices and the service made by the men and women who served the crown and country in the defense of Canada. Dating back to the War of 1812, people from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and linguistic groups have come together to defend what would become the Dominion of Canada. We are right to pause and reflect upon the service that has been given by our ancestors and by those who continue to serve. Despite the valiant achievements of generations of previous soldiers, sailors, and air personnel, for most of our history, the service was not one of equality. It was service given by all Canadians, yet not all service was viewed as being of the same value. African Nova Scotians, along with Aboriginal Canadians, Chinese Canadians, Japanese Canadians, Ukrainian Canadians, and others, rushed to the colors. Thankfully, a trend that continues in a large part today because of the great strides made by the modern Canadian forces to be inclusive and representative of our society as a whole. Despite their willingness to give sweat blood in their very lives, the servicemen of a century ago were treated as lesser servants of the Crown. In a wide variety of conflicts that played an important role in shaping the country we call home, Commemoration without context lacks true meaning, and the context of the number two construction battalion service during the Great War was one that all Nova Scotians can certainly be proud of, especially those of African descent. What has always struck me about the members of the two construction battalion is that despite, as we have heard, despite the entrenched racism and prejudice that they endured, before and throughout their service as members of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. Their loyalty, they loyally served king and country for little reward and recognition that would come only long after most of them had passed on. They served Canada and they helped to build the country we know today. They set an example for all Canadians. They served at a time with uh, extreme adversity. They served at a, at a time when uh, Canada was needed. They stepped up. More importantly, they have set an example for all of us. 
how important it, it is to send a message across Canada of, a, of inclusiveness so that it gives an opportunity for all Canadians to serve. So they have literally opened the doors for many of us, including myself, to be able to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. Well, it's an honor to be here today to participate in an act of remembrance, a solemn act, to honor worthy men who served our country in time of war. I stand proudly uh, with you today to reaffirm our deep respect for the soldiers of Number 2 Construction Battalion, men imbued with patriotism, selflessness, and the dignity to withstand the barbs of intolerance in order to proudly serve Canada and the cause for which we were fighting. Let us not mince words. These men signed up to fight and, if necessary, to die for their country. Instead, we did not deem them worthy of this honour and turned, to, turned them to other, albeit necessary, endeavours in uniform. I'm here in part because I fear that the critical role that they played in the war effort might fade into history. Now that I've been here and seen what you do, I am less concerned that that will happen. Nonetheless, it needs to be resurrected, and resurrected often. It's better than just a good war story, you know, it's devoid of the context, uh, devoid of uh, what this meant at the time. Here, today, understanding what that context is means everything to me. They will not grow old as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them.
we will remember them. The bugle called, and forth we went, to serve the crown, our backs far bent, and build whate'er that must be done, but ne'er to fire an angry gun. No heroes we, no, nay, not one. With deep lament we did our job, despite the shame our manhood robbed. We built and fixed and fixed again to prove our worth as proud black men and hasten sure the Kaiser's end. From Scotia port to Seaford Square, across to France, the conflict there, at Villageu and Place Perron, for God and King to right the wrong, the number two, six hundred strong. Stripped to the waist and sweated chest, midday's reprieve, much needed rest. We dug and hauled and lifted high from trenches deep towards the sky. Non fighting troops, and yet we die. The peace restored. The battle won, black sweat and toil had beat the Hun, black blood was spilled, black bodies maimed, for medals brave, no black was named, yet proud were we, our pride unshamed. But time will bring forth other wars, then give to us more daring chores that we might prove our courage strong, preserve the right, repel the wrong, and proud we'll sing the battle song. Today, we honor more than 600 men who formed the number two construction battalion, men who want to serve and served their country proudly and faithfully, despite how they were viewed by society. These men who traveled from many parts of the world saw the need to be a part of a call that the world was now demanding that we look beyond race. And this regiment would be responsible for what we see today is a diverse Canadian military. This was not a well-known part of Canadian history. And it wasn't well-known, I'd say, for different reasons, but also when they came back. You know, they had, they had trained in obscurity, they served in obscurity, and they came back in virtual obscurity. And when they came back, the battalion, uh, a year later, was disbanded. So there were no remnants of it. There's, no, there's nothing to say, here's the Black Battalion. It, does, it no longer existed. So it came into being, and then it vanished. And it wasn't until my father began doing his work and his, his research that it was found there was this Black Battalion that had existed. Um, he had heard of it when he was a young man. He had seen the lapel pins on the buttons of individuals who were porters, Black porters, on the, on the, on the railway. And he asked them what it was. And he spoke to this Black Battalion. He didn't know of it. He didn't know it. And then he started asking them more and more about it. And it became, it became important to him to find out what the story was. And the story became amazing in and of itself. But it took a lot of years to find it out. Because the, even then when you first started, there wasn't a big interest in this. Uh, and at that time, I mean, it, it was a, in some ways a confluence of, of fates, a confluence of circumstances, that he started his interest while there were still members alive. They no longer exist. When blacks were denied the right to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces, it had been suggested at one point uh, by the, the, the then, I guess, chief of staff, um, probably the proper title, but the chief of staff, that perhaps they could go and serve in the U.S. They could go to the U.S. and serve uh, because they'd get more pay there and maybe they'd feel more at home sort of thing. Once again, I said he didn't want to be humiliated here in Canada, so let's, let's send them across the board, let them serve over there because there they may have a better, more of a reason for doing so. Well, that didn't happen, but in fact, when Canada formed the Black Battalion, 
a large number of U.S. black men came to Canada and became part of the black battalion here in Nova Scotia. And no, I mean, Nova Scotia men, black men, made up the largest number of, of, of recruits for the black battalion. But we had American, we had people from the West Indies who joined the black battalion.